Hey everyone, so welcome to this video where we'll explore network properties in Photon Fusion. This tutorial is going to be specifically for shared mode, so feel free to follow along. We're actually going to be working on how to synchronize the player body colors across the network, and also understanding the bigger picture, like what they could be used for, and really how powerful they can be. So uh, yeah, let's begin. So as you can see right here, I have a clean slate project. It's a 2D one. So you can go ahead and create a new one as well. So the first thing we need to do is actually getting the Fusion SDK. You can either do it from the asset store or get it from the Photon official website. I will just go ahead and download it from the official website. So right here we have the get Fusion SDK. I will download the most uh, stable one, the latest build. Just make sure to be logged in in order to get a download. I would go ahead and import the package. You can see we have a bunch of stuff here. Let's hit import. Once you actually finish compiling, you will see this window. In the case you actually missed it, uh, you can go into tools, fusion, and then fusion hub. Uh, we need to actually import a fusion app ID. We can grab that from the photon dashboard. So again, just make sure to be logged in and go into dashboard, create a new app. I'm gonna choose multiplayer game, fusion. We're gonna be using fusion 2 give some application name and that should be it for now i'm gonna hit create there is an app id right here let's grab this one just gonna paste it and hit enter and uh, yeah now you can see the check mark and that's pretty much it now we can actually get into the unity side of things so for this tutorial we can actually use the tools that photon fusion provides us if you go ahead into the tools fusion and you're gonna see that the last option has setup network in the scene if I hit that, it will actually instantiate two objects, prototype network start and prototype runner. Uh, this is actually in order to save us time, so if you actually run the game, you're gonna see that this little UI appears with all of the options that the plugin provides us. We can start single player, shared mode, server, host, and so on. We actually wanna use the start shared mode. And again, for this tutorial and actually for prototyping in general, it's really convenient to use. So cool, we actually wanna start by actually spawning a player. So what I will do for now is actually creating a simple ground and a background just, you know, to keep things a bit more visualized. Uh, so I'll just create a, a sprite and i'll hit square i'm just gonna stretch it a bit and uh, maybe speed the video a bit so uh, it's literally only visuals okay this is enough for me i'm gonna just rename it to ground and uh yeah i need to create a little player our player is gonna be spawning during runtime because once we actually hit the play button and then we hit the start shared client we actually want to instantiate our player so for us to actually achieve that we need to create a player prefab so what i'll do here is just create an empty object i would call it as player and inside of that i would create another empty object i would call it as graphics and inside of graphics, I will just create another square. So 2D object, sprites, and a square. I'm just going to play around and just create a little player. So you can follow along or maybe even do something simpler, but uh, yeah. Um, cool, so I created this little weird alien. I'm just going to go ahead and rename the body parts. So those two are just eyes nice uh, if you want to make sure that it would be rendered above you can just add a new sorting layer call it player apply to all of the body parts and i'm just gonna make sure that the order is correct so the eyes are always gonna be above I'm gonna put two the head is gonna be one and the legs can be stayed as zero now the thing i want to do is create a new folder i will call it as prefabs so for us to actually instantiate a player across the network, we will actually need it to have a network object component. So if I go ahead and do network object, well, first of all, it's going to tell us that this object has not been baked yet. So let's just save the scene. So now Fusion knows that this player is some kind of a network object. Now let's just go ahead and drag it into the prefab folder and delete it from the scene. So let's go ahead and create our player spawner. I'm just going to create a new folder, call them scripts. And right here, I'm just going to create a new c -sharp script and call it as player spawner. 
So what we want to do is uh, fairly simple. We need to know once a player joined and once he did, we actually want to just spawn it. So we don't want to inherit from mono behavior. We want to have some kind of on player joined event and we actually do have them in Fusion SDK. So in order to actually implement them, we want to inherit from simulation behavior and also implement the interface I player joined. This will force us to actually implement a missing member so as you can see, public void, player joined, and it provides here a player ref, so the reference struct of that player. So we can actually remove the start and update. And here we actually want to create two things. The first is a serialized field, private, game object. I'm just going to call it as player prefab. And another thing is getting actually spawn points. So I'm just going to do private transform, and it's going to be an array. And I call it as spawn points. So player joined is called when a player is joined. We need to connect this callback actually. So it will be called. But this is a thing later in the editor. So inside of the player joined, we want to spawn our own local player. So I can do if player, which is the reference, equals to the runner we have inside of the simulation behavior, that local player. So now that we know that this is our own local player that had been joined, we can do var index equals to player dot as index and i'm gonna be using the modular key just in case that the id is bigger than the length we have in the spawn points and i'll do spawn points that length this way we can actually grab the spawn point itself so now i can do runner dot spawn providing the player prefab and for the second parameter i'll do spawn points provide the index dot position for the rotation i'll just use the identity one so i wouldn't touch it and for the last thing, I will provide the player reference. So later on, we'll know that we have the input authority over that object. So the player itself. And yeah, that's pretty much it. We can go back into Unity. So inside the editor, we want to make sure to drag our player spawner somewhere. Um, now I can create theoretically, just drag it here to an empty object. But then our event, player joined, won't be called because we didn't hook it up with the Fusion API. So an easy solution, if you go ahead and go into the prototype runner, you're going to see network events. These are all of the events that we are visible to. So unconnected to server and so on. But if you'll see here, we have the player joined. Now, if I go ahead and actually drag the player spawner into the prototype runner, which sits on the network events, it will automatically know that on this component, it will check and see that, hey, someone is implementing this iPlayer joined, thus call this method. Okay, so it is important to just make sure and drag it into the prototype runner in this sample. I'm just going to drag the player prefab right here. And I'm going to create a few spawn points. So create empty. I will lock the inspector and just drag all of them. Nice. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit play. Start shell mode. And there you go, our player is being spawned, although overlapping a bit. Uh, what we can do is just maybe just increasing the spawn point height. So I'm just going to put it like this. Okay, nice. So it looks good. Okay, so now that we have a basic player spawner, if you would actually go into file and then build and run, you would see that the player positions are not going to be synchronized across the machines. So one player can actually see him like this, and the other one can see this one like this. This is because we are not actually synchronizing the positions right here. So for this prototype, we can actually just go into the player prefab and do add component, and I'm just going to add the network transform. This will just ensure to sync our positions, although not ideal, because our players are not moving and I could potentially just sync the start position but this is completely fine for this prototype. Okay good so let us actually create a new script it's gonna be a c-sharp script and I'm gonna be calling it as networked player color. Let's open this up. Okay so let me just delete those. I'm going to be creating two things here for the inspector. So one is gonna be serialized field private sprite render and it's gonna be an array this is gonna be the body parts so i'm just gonna be calling it as body parts the second one is gonna be another serialized field private and it's gonna be the color struct and again an array and i'm gonna be calling it as player colors and that's pretty much it for now let's go back into unity i'm gonna be dragging the network player color into the prefab and as you can see we have both the arrays i'm just gonna lock this one and i'm gonna be marking all of the body parts and just gonna drag this so now let's create a few predefined colors in the inspector so the first one is gonna be something as this 
Okay, nice. So now that we have the predefined colors, we can go back into the code. Okay, so let's start by creating a private int and call this one as color index. Okay, you could do it with capital letter or smaller, doesn't really matter. Okay, so this color index, we just want to synchronize this across the network. So if you are playing with someone named Josh, you want Josh to know that your color index is one. And if it's one, you're gonna access the color array, meaning that back in Unity, one is gonna go into element one and it's gonna pick this little color. So in Fusion, it's actually pretty easy to synchronize them. So instead of inheriting for mono behavior, it's gonna be network behavior. And this is because now we can actually use the new attribute called networked. This networked attribute will give us a little arrow sign. This is because we need to apply a get and a setter. So what is networked? This is an attribute that Fusion provides us. If I put my mouse on it, you will see it's in class fusion.network attributes. This actually tells Fusion, hey, I want this integer to be synced across the network. I don't know when, I don't know who I want it to sync to, but I do want it to be synced at some point, some time, and to someone. So there are a few important things to know. I can't really serialize or use the network attribute on every data type. I can use it on primitive and all of the important stuff. You will see it in a few moments. But if I go ahead and change this one, let's say to game up, Object. Let's call it OPJ and then go back into Unity. You will see that we have a bunch of arrows and if I go back, this is because we can't really network like a whole complex data type. But for example, if I want to now synchronize a text or the player name, I wouldn't go ahead and do networked private text mesh pro UGUI because it wouldn't make sense. I can't just synchronize this all complex object. But if I want to actually synchronize the player name, I wouldn't synchronize this whole thing. I will just synchronize a string. Or in Fusion case, you also have network string. There is a link below to actually read about it and know what uh, data types you can actually sync. But this is really not an issue because what you want to do, uh, theoretically speaking, are actually manipulating the primitive types like an array, an struct, uh, an integer, a string, and so on, and then manipulating the visual stuff accordingly. So here, for example, we are going to be synchronizing the integer that will access the array and then pick up the color specifically here. The last thing that we should know is that when we are modifying a data type that is networked, we actually want to make sure that we have the state authority over this networked object. So this network player color is on the player prefab and is inheriting from network behavior. We want to know that we have the state authority over this networked object. So how do we check that? It's pretty easy. Just do if object, and you will see we have your networked object. This is part of the base class here dot has state authority. And it also tells you right here that if you have the state authority over this uh, entity right here. If we do have actually the state authority, it means that we can manipulate this variable, this network variable here. We have the control over this entity, thus I am in charge of controlling this one. So right here I'm going to do int, calling it player ID equals to object, the network object here, dot state authority, dot player ID. And right below it I'm going to do int some color index equals to player id and i'm gonna be using the modular key again just to be safe on the player colors that length now the last thing is just applying to the network variable we have so let's do color index equals to some color index now let's create here a new function so i'm gonna be calling it as private void apply player color so inside i'm gonna do val current color equals to player colors providing with the color index and I'm gonna do the for each on the body parts. And here I'm gonna be calling it as body part. And now I can do body part dot color equals to current color. So now we can call this function right here outside of the if statement. And cool, let's go back into Unity. Let's go ahead and run and see what happens. Start shared client. Okay, nice. So you would see I don't have any eyes. This is because I actually dragged the eyes as well. I should remove them. But besides that, you're going to see that we do have some kind of a color change. We selected the second one or the first element actually. So let me just go ahead and open the player. I'm just going to remove the two eyes because I don't want to change their colors. Okay, so let's actually do a quick test. I want to actually do file, build settings and do a quick build just to see what's going to happen. So in the instance here, I'm going to do start shared client. Okay, so I have here the blue color. I'm going to run the editor. Pretty cool. So this guy is yellow, this guy is yellow, and so on. So it is being synchronized. But what if I actually want to change it dynamically every time I press the space key? So how do we actually do that? 
we can open back the code. So in order to actually change the declare colors, we can do void update. And here inside I can do if object has state authority and input dot get key down. And I'm going to be using the space key code. Here inside, I'm just going to cycle to the next index. I'm going to do var next index equals to open parentheses color index plus one. And again, using the modular keyword just to be safe by player colors dot length. Now we can actually apply the color index to the next index. So here we can do color index equals to next index and yes this is pretty much it for now now this will actually change the color index but it doesn't really do anything i mean i can't really take this function and call it here because it will only be called locally so fusion actually has a cool way to solve this if you go into the network and put comma i can do on change the render and if i'll put my mouse on it you're gonna see it asks us to give a string of a method name so let's actually give a method name here and we'll explain about it in a second so i'm gonna do here private void on color index changed and i'm gonna grab this one and do name of and provide the function name so on change render is an actual attribute inside of photon fusion api and it's actually a really convenient way that fusion tells us hey the state of this integer in this case was changed meaning that hey if it was one at the beginning let's say and then we change it after that to two it would actually call this method because fusion knows that the old state was one and the new state became two and that's not the state as before and thus it will call this method right here so with that in mind, we know for a fact that we can just call the apply player caller right here. We can go back into Unity. I'm just going to do file, build and run. So now if I'm going to press space on the instance, you will see I became yellow and also on this machine I became yellow and so on. And it also works here in the editor itself. I became green and here, I'm green here as well. So this is pretty much it. I do want to give a little tip if I go back into the code. So generally speaking, when it comes to making online multiplayer games, we want to be as efficient as possible and save as much data as we can to flow across the network. So here specifically, we are syncing an integer, which is four bytes, which could sound a lot or could not sound a lot. But here specifically, I can get away with actually syncing a whole single byte. I can change this data type to a byte. And here instead, the color index, I can just cast it into a byte. And same thing actually goes here. And yeah, that's it. Really easy optimization here. That's pretty much it. I highly encourage you to check the links down below. There are also the photon samples on the website, which you could play around with. So yeah, thank you for watching and have a good one.